Awo, shalom. Shalom once again. This is your brother Wendon Yado of the Lion of Jesus Society of the Imperial Majesty, otherwise known as Arasi Adino Safari Neng. And because of one particular um, comment from a brother concerning um, what we meant by the crucifixion of his majesty, in order to try to articulate some of the basics concerning that particular subject matter, that we know that some uh, Rastafari would protest and, and, you know, disagree with His Majesty not being crucified, so forth and so on, but His Majesty is the conquering line of the child, but all that being true. But we have to understand the concept and the, and the context, really, the context of Scripture, the real, the real um, proper, proper um, perspective of Scripture. And this led I and I after the particular reasoning we just did, to the political crucifixion of his majesty, to just meditate on the subject matter. Of course, it begins with the Bible and understanding the Bible in its proper context. But there's some historical events that if we were to look at them now from an Ethiopic or an Ethiopian Hebrew perspective, if we would look at it from our own perspective now, not from a Eurocentric or white Western Anglo-American perspective, but from an Ethiopian Hebrew perspective, we then will be able to see the half of the story in its proper context and really be able to view the, the present, what's in front of us presently on, on the whole world scene, the global scene more correctly. So this brought up um, the subject matter of Haile Selassie, and the Tower of Babel. Hila Selassie and the Tower of Babel. Mm. Let's put this right here. Hila Selassie and Tower of Babel. You remember the speech of His Majesty? He just mentioned the speech of his majesty. Now this connects with the subject matter of the crucifixion of his imperial majesty or the political crucifixion. In order to articulate our point now from the context of history or world history, remember his majesty teaches us that God and history shall judge. So we need to firstly have a a, the, the true theological groundation and foundation. But we need to understand the words, the themes, the concepts, so forth and so on scripturally. And, that, and that's where the work of discipleship is important, is familiarizing ourselves or re-familiarizing ourselves with the biblical scriptural context removed uh, from it, the racism, the whitewash, the Gentile misinterpretations, all of that being removed from it. And that's, and that's a, a work or a labor of love in itself. But discipleship helps us as we start to look at what the Bible really means, the proper interpretation and from an Ethiopian Hebrew perspective. Now, on the Hala Selassie and the Tower of Babel, you recall, I think it's Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 11. Now, it's no, I don't think it's a coincidence that 11 looks like two towers, right? That, that 11 looks like two towers, one, one, and, and a lot of folks have written about the 11, the two towers, and tarot card, the towers, and all this is going to come into proper perspective as we are able to unfold the teaching and then to bring some of the evidence, the king's evidence. I mean, the evidence that we present is the king of kings evidence because this is a prosecution of truth and righteousness and justice, Yovas. This is what it's always been about. And if we receive his majesty, if we Kabbalah his majesty correctly and, and from an Ethiopian, a true faithful Ethiopian and the Hebrew perspective, we'll be able to see this. Now, concerning the Tower of Babel, mm-hmm. If we go to Genesis, and we only got a couple of uh, minutes in this portion of the lecture and teaching, and hopefully Yah willing will, will, will come forward again and build up on this, and we might present on our website a couple of clips 
maybe videos or other information, which are just segments and portions, and Yao Woolen will bring it together in a DVD or a video format. But we're going to go through this as is so ones and ones can get a, um, a perspective of this subject matter and perhaps can even study portions of it for themselves and look into some of that which we present here. Let's go quickly through this. Let's go to Genesis chapter 11 so we can at least establish the foundation for this lecture. Now, in Genesis chapter 11 says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it, now, on language and speech, we have a new work that we have published recently. And let's see if we can get that. All right, this new work that we published recently, um, some of the new ones, this is a play, Tiatia. This is uh, Mahale Mahali Ze Solomon of the Song of Songs of Solomon. This is more on the arts, education and fine arts. That's on the fine arts agenda. This is um, the gospel of him, book one, book one, trying to establish some of the foundation concerning the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ. And this is Ethiopic first language. Ethiopic First Language. You can go to www.lojsociety.org and you can purchase a copy, get a copy of this right here, Ethiopic First Language. So some of the more detailed background of this particular verse and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech is contained in this particular document. And as we have opportunity, we'll refer and make a couple of quotes, um, references to this that gives more details on the subject matter. So we're going to go past this verse because we can actually say that this book actually gives the, some of the footnotes to this particular, the meaning and the context of this particular verse in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Once again, and the whole earth, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, there's a footnote here in the Schofield Study Bible that speaks on Babel. What is Babel? Babel or Babel. Babel. Babel means confusion, and Babel means the gate of El, the gate of Hail, or like as in Hila, the gate of God or the gate of the power. So we have two words from the Shemitic, in the Afro Shemitic sense. We have, we have two words or two meanings to this one word sound. And this is the power in the Afro-Shemitic and the biblical language. When we say Babal, that is to say Babel, it means confusion. But when we say Bab El, it means the gate of God or the gate of Hail, the gate of the power. But the history of Babel in the sense of confusion strikingly parallels that of the professing church. So the Schofield Study Bible is giving us a footnote next to one language and say the history of Babel confusion strikingly parallels that of the professing church because the professing church or the orthodox church actually is supposed to represent the gate of God. It's supposed to be the gate to the kingdom of God is the church. But instead it has become Babel. And Babal means confusion. And, and, and we need not go over all the religious theological confusion from the whitewash Anglo-European and Gentile perspective that permeates the entire earth. You understand? So the language in the sense of this earth now from a Christian sense is confusion. It's, it, there's confusion. So this is why Babel strikingly parallels that of the professing church. One, the first point is unity. Genesis 11 and 1, the apostolic church. That's the first point. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verses 32 to, to 33. Then secondly, we have ambition. The professing church has ambition. Genesis chapter uh, 11, verse 4. Using worldly, the professing church, it uses worldly but not spiritual means, according to Genesis chapter 11, verse 3, ending in a man-made unity. It ends in a man-made unity, which is, according to the footnote here in the Schofield Study Bible, 
the papacy. The papacy. So this man-made unity ends in the papacy. In the last video, or the video that we just did on, um, what was that, the political crucifixion of his majesty, we had, um, we had mentioned um, uh, uh, Frontline. Frontline, PBS Frontline had something on um, recently in the season, um, Christmas, quote, season, had something on from Jesus to Christ. And it's talking about basically this, this man-made unity, the Roman Empire pretending itself to be the kingdom of, of God in that sense. And a lot of people actually believe that confusion. But let's go to the third point. The third point is the confusion of tongues. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, that is the confusion of tongues, of language. When This is why you have a lot of so-called Christians. Christians don't say they're Christians. They say they're denominations. They say they are demon nomination, the denomination, like one says I'm of Paul, one says I'm of Apollo. They say they're denominations. You know, one says I'm a Catholic. They say they're a Catholic. They say the denomination before they say Christ. So their denomination becomes more important than their Christina, than their Christianity. So the, and there's a confusion of what, what means. If you ask most folks, who, are, who so you're a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. I'm just curious, what does Christ mean? They'll tell you a whole, most Christians, not all, but most Christians will tell you a whole lot of things. The, the love of God, the Savior, uh, you know, um, all nice, nice sounding things. But they don't tell you that it means the anointed and then explain the anointed and the Messiah. They don't explain that. They don't tell you that. So there's a confusion of, of tongues. Protestantism with its innumerable, innumerable sects. Is numerous denominations and divisions of protestant, of terra maria, of being an enemy or opposition to the black mother. That's basically what protestantism really comes down to. Yes, there are some good themes like the Bible being published to everybody, Martin Lutherism, so forth and so on. But then when we look at the confusion now, presently, and the evil world, the chlorum that we live in, and the nominal Christians and churches, it's just confusion. Now, it says, see Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1, and the note. So we're going to go to Isaiah chapter, let's go quickly to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. Uh, 13 and 1. Okay, Isaiah chapter 13, 1. Here it says, the burden of Babylon a prophecy to be fulfilled in the, notice, in the day of the Lord. In the day of the Lord. Um, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. The brother Smyrna Angel had made a comment concerning um, that, that these Goyim, these guys, you understand, would try to gang up against his, his match against the king of kings, but the king of kings will prevail. He is the overcomer. He is more on Bethlehem and together Yehuda. Then it talks about, um, it gives some references here. Then it speaks about the Gentile nations, which is the Goys, the Gentiles, or the Anglo-Europeans. So let us understand this lecture here, Hala Selassie, and the Tower of Babel. First, we're going to explain the Tower of Babel in this context. And we went to Genesis chapter 11, and we're still in verse 1. Now here it says, there's a footnote here. It says, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amot, did see. Now, a burden in the Hebrew is the masa. Masa. Masa is burden. That means a heavy, weighty thing is a message or oracle. It's a word, a kalat, concerning Babylon, Assyria, Jerusalem, etc. It is heavy. It is called masa, or it is heavy because the wrath of God the wrath of Jah, the wrath of Yahweh, of Elohim, Ha Elohim Baruch Hu, is in it. And it's grievous for the prophet, for the Nabi, 
to declare. It's grievous. It's a burden. It's like us talking about the whole Martin Luther King Jr. thing and the, and the lying dreams and dream a lie. And I, uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, I think verse 25, where it's talking about how the prophets will lie to God's people and recognizing that this lost sheep of the house of Israel is black folks, in particular Judah, the Negro, African-American Negroes, and what has happened to us historically over these 40 years, it's, it's, it's grievous. It's a heavy burden. I, I, I mean, well, not a heavy burden, but in the context of the prophet. But for us, it's a joy. You understand? Because we know how this fits into the bigger picture, the scheme of things. But it's grievous for the prophet to declare. The second point about Babylon is what we were trying to get to. Because from Babel comes Babylon. So what we can do right here is under here we can put... Babylon, Babylon. So the root is Babel. You understand? Most associate Babel with Babylon, but they can't really explain, well, what's the connection? Why do they say two different things? I mean, yeah, we can see how they're, they're similar, but, but what's up with that? Like why this is baby, uh, the Y is there instead of the E, and then we have the on. Is that on, Anunnaki or something like that? What is that all about? But it says the city Babylon is not in view here. So according to this prophecy now in Isaiah chapter 13, the city of Babylon is not in view here. As the immediate context shows, so the immediate context of this will show it's not just the city of Babylon. So we have to make the distinction. We hear Babylon, but what is it talking about? Babylon the city? Or is it something else than Babylon the city? It is important to note the significance of the name when used symbolically. So here the Schofield Study Bible is telling us that it's important to note the, the significance of the name when it's spoken, Isaiah chapter 13, and let's go 1, and we're here in Genesis chapter 11, 1. So we have 1, 1, 1, 1, 3, 1. So let's, let us get the 4, 1, 1, so to speak, on this. So... It's important to know the significance of the name when it's used symbolically, when it's used as a verbal hieroglyphic. And this is a terminology that we coined to express that, uh, that verbally or according to the word, there are hieroglyphic images. And in a sense, the Egyptians had it right in the way that they utilized the symbolic logic. More people could understand. People nowadays don't understand because of the confusion of tongues and, and words. That's why it's difficult for them to, to interpret it accurately. But Babylon is the Greek form. So Babylon is the Greek form. Babel or Babel is the Hebrew or the Afro-Shemitic form. Invariably in the OT, the Old Testament, the Belui Kidan, Hebrew, the word is simply Babel the meaning of which is confusion, confusion. And in this sense, the word is used symbolically. One, in the prophets, when the actual city is not meant, the reference is to the confusion into which 